Brethren and guests, today I invite you to join us as we knock at the portals of Pennsylvania Grand Lodge's past and take you back 290 years to the beginning of our ancient and honorable fraternity here in Philadelphia in a presentation I call From Taverns to Temples, Homes of the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania since 1731. So why, you may ask, did Masonic Lodges once meet in taverns? Taverns were natural gathering places in Great Britain where modern Freemasonry was started and in colonial America where meetings and gatherings of many types were held. During or afterward, or both, food and drink was easily available. Singing and drinking toasts around the festive board were also both part of the bro brotherly conviviality. Many lodges used special glasses known as Masonic cannons or firing glasses when toasting. Here are some original examples from our collection here at the temple. These were designed with an exceptionally thick bottom so that at the conclusion of a toast, the members would bring them all down together on the wooden tavern tables, making a loud booming sound like a cannon. Here you can see a British list of Masonic lodges from 1733, showing one such lodge meeting at the Devil Tavern in Temple Bar, London. One member of that lodge, Daniel Cox, would go on to be the first Grand Master of the Provincial Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania meeting here in Philadelphia. It is for these reasons that the first stop on our tour is Tun Tavern, which was owned by brother John Hobart and considered Pennsylvania Freemasonry's first home. At least one lodge was meeting here informally in 1730. That lodge, known only as the Lodge at the Tavern, eventually became St. John's Lodge No. 1. Brother Benjamin Franklin became a Mason here in 1731. On St. John's Day, June 1732, a Grand Lodge meeting is known to have been held here. It was located on the east side of what was then known as King or Water Street, but now known as South Front Street. It was also referred to as Peggy Mullen's Beef Steakhouse after the wife of an other proprietor, Thomas Mullen. Thomas was also the treasurer of Tun Tavern Lodge Number no. 3. There is also mention of the Grand Lodge meeting at a Sun Tavern on the very same street, but many researchers attribute this to a typographical error in one of Benjamin Franklin's Pennsylvania Gazette editions. This illustration from the Pennsylvania Historical Society alleges to show a depiction of St. John's Lodge No. 1 holding a meeting here, but no further information is available about the sketch. Whether it shows Tun Tavern or not, it gives a good idea of what a lodge room would have looked like on one of the upper floors of a tavern at that time. The Tun Tavern site is now identified by a historic marker located on Front Street, commemorating it as the birthplace of the U.S. Marine Corps in 1775 and memorialized in a small nearby park with a marker noting that it was also the founding location of the St. Andrews Society in 1747. The St. Andrews Society was founded to help the large number of destitute Scots arriving in Philadelphia at that time. In 1735, our early brethren moved the meeting place of the Grand Lodge up to High Street, known today as Market Street, in the heart of the city commerce first to the Indian King Tavern. This was also the meeting place of Franklin's Punto Club, which was also known as the Leather Apron Club, a reference to the aprons that many workers would wear while plying their trades and not to Masonic aprons. They met Friday evenings to hold discussions about morals, philosophy, and other similar topics. In the year 1749, the location was changed once again, this time just to the east, still on Market Street, to the Royal Standard Tavern. This photo shows the neighborhood today from the perspective of the color print that you saw previously. The Indian King sat just east of Third Street or Market Street, and the Royal Standard was located at the corner of Market and Bank Streets. By 1752, the brethren were, <clears throat> the brethren were growing tired of meeting in public houses and decided to build their own meeting place. By the late 18th century, Philadelphia had one tavern for every 25 men living in the city, so a want of more privacy and space drove this decision. As the membership numbers began to climb, space in the second floor dining room of a tavern was simply too crowded. It also presented a better image to the public. This led them to erect the first building in the Western Hemisphere solely for this purpose. 
known as Freemasons Lodge, it was dedicated on St. John's Day, 1755, by a procession from the Lodge building to Christ Church, after which a banquet was held back at the hall, which was used from 1755 to 68, and again from 1778 to 1785. In the fall of 1777, as the British were threatening Philadelphia from south of the city, a number of Quaker leaders who wanted to remain out of the conflict were rounded up under suspicion of being loyalists and were imprisoned in this Masonic building. Eventually, the Continental Congress agreed with the Pennsylvania Council, who had arrested them in the first place, and they were exiled to Winchester in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. This building was taken for use as a jail during at least a few of the Revolutionary War years. Financial difficulties following the American Revolution led to the building being sold in 1785. Freemasons Lodge was located in what is now the parking lot behind the U.S. Customs House, just off of 2nd Street. Grand Lodge sometimes met from 1769 to 1790 in a building about 100 feet away from Freemasons Lodge in what was then known as Vidal's Alley. It was here on September 25, 1786, that a meeting was held, which resulted in severing our ties with the Grand Lodge of England. This building was the home of Stephen Vidal a school teacher and member of Tun Tavern Lodge Number no. 3 since 1749. Grand Lodge occasionally met here until about 1790 because the house was available during the evenings. In the year 1887, a magic lantern slideshow, an ancestor of the now common PowerPoint presentation, was given here in the present Masonic Temple on the history of Freemasonry in Philadelphia. One of the slides in that show identifies this as the lodge building on the Dells Alley. Although this does not look like the building in the painting, as you probably know, after more than a century, a building can undergo so many renovations as to make it appear unrecognizable. Also, as late as 1895, Vidal's Alley and the surrounding neighborhood still existed. This neighborhood no longer exists, and this building was located approximately in the center of the present U.S. Customs House. Up until the British occupation of Philadelphia in the Revolutionary War, the Grand Lodge met at the City Tavern, which contained the second largest ballroom in the New World, so space would not have been an issue. This establishment was the gathering place for many of the famous actors who would be prominent in the founding of this country and the signers of many of our most important founding documents. It was reconstructed in the 1970s for the Bicentennial, the original having burned down in the mid 19th century. One of the things that the paintings in this presentation fail to portray is the deplorable conditions that existed in most 18th century cities. Pigs and chickens roaming about at will, horses and other livestock leaving aromatic signs of their presence and generally bad sanitation and drainage. Of course, these paintings were meant to showcase our ancient meeting places, but what were left, that little urchin blowing on a torch, is a link boy. You would hire one to use like an 18th century flashlight having him escort you through the dark streets to your destination. If you, were if you were unlucky and got a bad one or you were particularly drunk, you could find one of these lads leading you down a dark alley where his friends waited to rob you of your valuables and leave you in the dark. You also have here a broken carriage, a bonfire, and in the upper left corner, you can see someone emptying the contents of a chamber pot out the window and right onto the head of this guy here. This is worshipful master Thomas DeVale a justice of the peace who was described as notorious for the severity of his punishments as he was for his immoral private life, hardly a worthy brother. He had four wives and 25 children. Hogarth did not like him, paternal considerations aside, and thus this humiliating depiction. He is being helped along by Grand Lodge Tyler Andrew Montgomery, who was described as a well-known and popular figure. Contrast that scene with this depiction of Center City, Philadelphia from a 1907 postcard in which the streets appear so clean and clear that even the statue of Billy Penn himself and all of City Hall appears to be dancing with joy. And if you look in the lower right-hand corner, you can see the police escorting a top hat wearing gentleman from some building across from City Hall. But of course that could be any building and any gentleman in a top hat. Jumping back to the 18th century, between 1790 and 1799, Grand Lodge rented the upper floor of the Quaker Meeting House, which can still be visited today at the corner of Arch and Fifth Streets. It can be seen here in another Magic Lantern slide photo from the 1880s, at which time it was known as Apprentice's Library, 
the first free library in the United States. This is also the first building used by the Grand Lodge for which we have an early indoor photograph. This image shows the second floor looking much the way it would have when it was used for, as a Masonic meeting place. Still standing to this day, it is the oldest Grand Lodge meeting place still in existence. It is now part of Independence National Historic Park. From 1800 to 1802, Governor Mifflin permitted Grand Lodge to use the office of the Secretary of the Senate in the Pennsylvania State House, which we now refer to as Independence Hall. This permission was granted because the Masons were broke, having contributed so much money to their members, widows, and orphans during the yellow fever epidemic of 1793, in which Philadelphia suffered the loss of 5,000 residents. Of course, this is the iconic Independence Hall today. This arrangement was never intended to be permanent, which is just as well, for our ancient brethren were asked to move out because of a complaint filed by the great American artist, Charles Wilson Peel, who had a gallery in the building and didn't like their rowdy behavior after meetings. It makes one wonder what Mr. Peel thought of this brouhaha right outside his door during election day of 1816. Consequently, in 1802, a plain three-story building was purchased on Filbert Street between 8th and 9th Streets. This building was known as Pennsylvania Freemasons Hall. The second and third stories were used for Masonic purposes, and the first was rented out to a brother for the purpose of running a school. His teaching the children of poor brethren was the rent he paid for this purpose. This location was chosen despite the objections of some brothers that it was too far out of town. At this time, the city of Philadelphia was pretty much limited to the few blocks around what we refer to today as Old City. Once you went beyond that area, it was sparsely settled. The X on this 1802 Philadelphia map shows this lodge building's location. The squiggly lines and dots you see marking nearby city blocks are farms. The red asterisk you see off to the left indicates the farm where our present temple is located, the spot where this broadcast is coming to you from today. The public square across from it is now where Philadelphia City Hall stands. Here is a picture of Freemasons Hall in 1880, shortly before being torn down. It stood behind what was formerly Strawbridge and Clothier's department store. By 1807, it was apparent that new, bigger quarters would be needed as Freemasonry in Philadelphia continued to grow. To this end, on St. John the Baptist Day, June 24, 1811, this magnificent new hall was dedicated with 31 lodges in attendance. Located on the north side of Chestnut Street between 7th and 8th Street, it was 101 feet 7 inches wide, 178 feet deep, and capped with a 180 foot tall wooden steeple. Freemasonry grew in the city as a result of the construction of this grand edifice. However, disaster struck. On the night of March 9, 1819, when a fire that began in a faulty fireplace flew, completely destroyed the temple and most of its contents. The first floor had been rented out that evening for a dance and a lodge meeting was being held on the second floor. Within two days, our brethren voted to rebuild and meanwhile returned to their old building on Filbert Street while construction carried on. The rebuilt hall was dedicated November 1st, 1820, this time without the steeple, but with illumination provided by an apparatus that burned carbureted hydrogen gas made from tar, making it the first gas illuminated building in Philadelphia. It was built with an informal arrangement with a dancing academy that it could be used as a ball and concert venue. To accommodate that purpose, the floor of the first floor public room was laid upon an arrangement of springs. This was known as a sprung floor. Because of this, on one occasion, the room was so packed with people that the floor suddenly compressed, causing considerable panic. It was here that General Lafayette was honored on his visit to Philadelphia in 1824. Other non-Masonic uses were political meetings, exhibitions of the Academy of the Fine Arts, and the Franklin Institute, which sometimes required covering over the entire front yard of the building. This was also the location of the very first Philadelphia Flower Show in 1829 a fact that was recently commemorated with a new historical marker at the temple's former location. We will be returning to speak about this building again in just a few moments. Because of the disastrous effects of the anti-Masonic movement in the late 1820s and early 1830s, Grand Lodge decided to sell the Chestnut Street building to the Franklin Institute and purchase Washington Hall, located on Third Street above Spruce. 
This had been the property of the Washington Benevolent Association, which presented us with Brother Washington's apron, which is still on display here in the museum. After the Grand Lodge left this location, the hall burned to the ground and a local Masonic brother erected a furniture and cabinet store on the site. It was here in that furniture and cabinet store that most of the woodwork in the temple we are in today was constructed. Here are some examples of this woodwork in our current temple at Broad and Filbert Streets. Today, the Washington Hall site contains only modern buildings. By 1841, the Franklin Institute defaulted on the mortgage for the old temple on Chestnut Street, seen here in a photograph taken in the early 1850s before it was torn down. Because of this, possession of the building reverted back to the Grand Lodge, which then rented it out for a variety of purposes, one of which was public entertainment. Freemason Charles Stratton, better known to the world as General Tom Thumb, and who gained worldwide fame working with well-known Freemason P.T. Barnum, performed here at least once in 1848, as did the famous showman, Ang and Chang Bunker, better known to the world as the Siamese Twins. This 1844 newspaper ad promotes the Fakir of Ava, an English magician named Hughes, who traveled far and wide wearing dark makeup and pretending he was from Burma. He would put on a variety of shows, as you can see here. And here I'll give you just a few seconds if you want to look over this um, list of performances that were taking place at the Masonic Hall on the Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And also in the same newspaper, there was an ad for the sale of this property. If you look at the address in this ad, you will see it says the temple was located between Delaware 7th and 8th Streets, which sounds confusing. Back at this time, the city of Philadelphia numbered streets from the Delaware River going west, as they do now, and from the Schuylkill River going east, which as the city grew became very confusing, and they went with the system that we now have to this day. In 1852, the Brethren decided to move back to the Chestnut Street location, as apparently no one was interested in purchasing it. Because some of the acts and performances were booked so indiscriminately, it gained a reputation as a place no decent person would want to be seen. For this reason, it was decided to tear it down and build an even bigger temple, as Freemasonry had grown so much in the years since they left the building. More meeting space was needed. Several of the windows from this structure were also reused in the construction of the Masonic Temple in Bristol, Pennsylvania, as seen in this modern day photo on the right. And I'll give you just a couple of seconds if you'd like to take a comparison of the 1850 photo and the contemporary photo. You can see the, uh, those windows still exist up, out in Bucks County. As construction began on this new temple, the original cornerstone from 1809 was discovered, as this article reports from the American Freemason magazine. Apparently, the builders were looking for it in the southeast corner and not the northeast corner, where cornerstones are traditionally placed. And you can see the writer got in a little dig at our expense, mocking us with pretty masons they were. The cornerstone laying ceremony for this new temple was conducted in the pouring rain on November 21st, 1853, as seen in this sketch made from an original daguerreotype photograph. This new hall was dedicated in 1855 at a ceremony attended by over 4,000 masons. It was constructed in the newly popular and wildly ornamental Gothic style and was considered at the time the most magnificent hall of its kind in the United States. It stood on the site of the previous hall. This photo taken around 1859 shows the Grand Lodge building within the context of its neighborhood, wall-to-wall -wall retail shops. In fact, the temple itself displays the typical mid 19th century shop awnings under which merchants would display their wares. This is because the ground floor was rented out as retail space. This is the first temple for which there exists a painting showing the lodge room. As you can see, the Gothic theme is carried to magnificent extremes here as well. And I'll just give you a few seconds to take a look at some of the details of this magnificently ornate room. This is also the first temple for which we have a period photo of the inside, showing the master's chair in the east and some of the carved wooden statuary. This is the same chair that currently resides in Gothic Hall here in this building. It is made of hand carved oak and was created in 1855 by Joseph Daly and Charles Bushler, the same sculptors who carved the figures strength, wisdom, beauty, hope, and faith, which appear in the painting and photograph and now reside on the second floor of our present building. Despite its magnificent looks, 
The building on Chestnut Street was costly and difficult to care for. The basement flooded frequently and the rooms proved too small. And I would like at this point to call your attention to the building that sits just to the left of the temple, uh, the four story building that has an awning in front of it where you can read the word carpeting. And I'm gonna point that out again in a few, uh, in a few minutes. After moving to our, into our current building in 1873, it was sold and used as a theater, the Temple Theater. The new owners also painted the brownstone exterior white, which upset a lot of Masons, even though it wasn't theirs anymore. This photo gives a much better image of the exterior Gothic design. I need to take a few seconds to take a look at some of that beautiful Gothic design. And again, I will call your attention to that building that sits just to the left of the temple. Unfortunately, this magnificent building burned down in 1886. The night it caught fire, December 27th, the traditional gathering and ceremonies were taking place in our current building for St. John's Day. When news of the fire reached here during the banquet, there were a number of Masons who ran over to witness the final minutes of their once grand temple. The Union Trust Company, seen here on the left, was built on that spot. Today, only the left side of that building can be seen on Chestnut Street. And if you take a look at the modern photo to your right, you can see the building I've been pointed out in the last couple of 19th century photos. The first floor has now been completely modernized and is where Morimoto's restaurant is located. But if you look from the second, third, and fourth floors, you can see that it pretty much hasn't changed since the mid 19th century. By 1868, our present property, which you can see here before being cleared, was already purchased at the corner of Filbert and Broad Street, and construction could begin. On St. John the Baptist Day, June 24, 1868, an estimated 10,000 Masons gathered to take part in the cornerstone laying ceremonies. <clears throat> Those conducting the actual ceremony can be seen here in the northeastern part of our property. If you look in the left foreground, you will see two objects that look like pictures. These are two of the three vessels which are used in a Masonic cornerstone ceremony to hold corn, wine, and oil. Here they are, along with a small bottle of corn, which was gathered up and saved by someone after the ceremony. These are still used to this day and are on display in our exhibit hall here at the temple. This photo shows the actual ceremony in progress with one of the participants pouring the contents of one of the containers onto the cornerstone. You can see his right hand pouring if you look directly underneath the pulley wheel in the upper portion of the photograph. Shortly after this, construction could begin. Except for interior decoration, the building was completed in 1873. On the morning of September 26, 1873, more than 13,000 Masons gathered in Philadelphia and marched south on Broad Street to the New Temple for dedication ceremonies. The Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania had finally found a suitable home in what has become a familiar landmark on the downtown Philadelphia streetscape. After 142 years of moving about, like the giant playing pieces on the oversized novelty game board over which it looms, the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania has come to rest at the heart of the city that gave it birth. How does a good man become even better? By working out? Or by working his way up the corporate ladder? By changing his diet? Or by changing his style? by traveling the world, or by staying perfectly still. For 300 years, we've helped good men become the best versions of themselves through a dedicated fraternity and by taking an oath to live a life of integrity, service, and brotherly love. Men who are as committed to each other and their families as they are to our noble cause. In the end, we don't just make men better, we make them Masons not just a man, a mason.
the right worshipful Grand Master. The officers of the Grand Lodge will take their respective stations and places. Just stay right here. Brethren, ladies, and friends, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Are we all excited to be here? Thank you for uh, coming today. Um, we're going to have a, we're going to have a very uh, serious and uh, solemn but fun ceremony dedicating our building um, and dedicating the Freemasonry in, in Philadelphia and our Commonwealth. Well, we're going to wait for a couple people. To, I think there's some people that need to come in yet. What? What's, what's going on? Deets. I I told you these guys could stop by for a visit, but this isn't my. What was this? My this is my kitchen. What? Brethren, ladies, and friends, these are our brothers from somewhere around L.A. And they have pedal biked over the last 41 days, 3,900 miles across this great nation on behalf of Freemasonry and the Shriners Hospitals. Stay there a minute. So, these guys are a hot mess. You have no idea. So there's six of them. They've managed to, to lose, what, three laptops, two backpacks, and they've lost 33% of their wallets across the country. And uh, they stopped at Brother Dietz's house, and he said, you know, when, when, I make, when Lindy and I make a meal, we, we, we have enough for two to three weeks of leftovers. So they made them dinner and breakfast, and when they left, there was no leftovers. So brethren, I want to thank you for coming in here, making this a stop. 
They're going to go to Silver Springs, Maryland tonight, so they can't stay with us. Um, we have a couple of uh, gifts. I think two of you already got them because they all got them because even Mark Haynes had no idea that this was going to happen. And we also have a, a, a very simple uh, certificate um, from the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. It says, Certify, Certificate of Acknowledgement, Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania proudly presents to the Shriners Cross Country Bikeathon. The Masons of Pennsylvania would give you $2,500 for your trip across the USA. It's signed by myself and Brother Mark A. Haynes, a Right Worshipful Grand Secretary. And this is yours. I don't know where you're going to put it, but if you would, Grand Marshal. Can you? They're up, right? They're up. They're up. Everybody up. Everybody up. Everybody up. I hereby proclaim Brother Jeffrey M. Wonderling, Right Worshipful Grand Master of the most ancient and honorable fraternity of free and accepted Masons in Pennsylvania and Masonic jurisdiction thereunto belonging. By virtue of the authority in me vested, I hereby proclaim Brother Larry A. Durr, Right Worshipful Deputy Grand Master of the most ancient and honorable fraternity of free and accepted Masons in Pennsylvania and Masonic jurisdiction thereunto belonging. By virtue of the authority in me vested, I hereby proclaim Brother Paul J. Rook, Right Worshipful Senior Grand Warden of the Right Worshipful Grand Lodge of the most ancient and honorable fraternity of free and accepted Masons of Pennsylvania and Masonic jurisdiction thereunto belonging. By virtue of the authority in me vested, I hereby proclaim Brother Lynn B. Baker, Right Worshipful Junior Grand Warden of the Right Worshipful Grand Lodge of the most ancient and honorable fraternity of free and accepted Masons of Pennsylvania and Masonic jurisdiction thereunto belonging. By virtue of the authority in me vested, I hereby proclaim Adam C. Hess, Right Worshipful Grand Treasurer of the Right Worshipful Grand Lodge of the most ancient and honorable fraternity of free and accepted Masons of Pennsylvania and Masonic jurisdiction thereunto belonging. By virtue of the authority in me vested, I hereby proclaim Brother Mark A. Haynes, Right Worshipful Grand Secretary of the Right Worshipful Grand Lodge of the most ancient and honorable fraternity of free and accepted Masons of Pennsylvania and Masonic jurisdiction thereunto belonging. Brethren, ladies, and friends, you will join with me in pledging allegiance to the flag of our country after which we will sing the first stanza of a national anthem.
pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our Father, and on their liberty is whole, grant we beseech thee that we and all the people of the land may with loyalty, fidelity, and courage maintain these liberties. Protect and assist all who are serving their country, at home or abroad, by land, by sea, or in the air, that they, being armed with thy defense, may be preserved evermore from all perils, and being filled with wisdom and courage with strength, may do their duty to thy honor and glory. Amen. So would be. stand as testimony to the prominence of Freemasonry, not only in Pennsylvania, but throughout America and around the world. The Masonic Fraternity was the oldest of the many membership associations which helped shape the social and cultural life of the post-Civil War period. This temple represents the resources of time, talent, and assets that Pennsylvania Masons granted in support of their missions of moral self-improvement and charity. The fraternity's membership has, had outgrown the Masonic Hall on Chestnut Street that the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania had occupied since 1855. It also required extensive repairs. Therefore, in 1866, a building committee was appointed to select a site, adopt a plan, and prepare an estimate for a new hall. They found a prominent site at the northeast corner of Broad and Filbert Streets. The land was comprised of four lots owned by several parties, who all agreed to sell it for a total of $158,000. The Grand Lodge purchased the site in 1867, which the committee described as, quote, far superior to any other in the city, both in the beauty of its location and in the facility of its approach from every quarter, end quote. The committee listed over 20 specifications for the building and invited six prominent architectural firms to bid on the work. 
Some of the architects were Masons, while others were not. The committee unanimously decided on architect James H. Windrum's Norman Revival design of an impressive granite structure. Brother Windrum was only 27 years old at the time. The job landed him other major commissions and led to a profitable career designing commercial, institutional, and government buildings. The new Masonic temple, imposing, picturesque, and prominently sited in a rapidly developing part of the town, was designed to make the virtues of a craft a lesson to the world. The Grand Lodge and its appendant bodies commemorated the temple's realization with elaborate ceremonies. The first was the cornerstone laying ceremony presided over by Grand Master Richard Falk on June 24th 1868, the feast day of St. John the Baptist, an estimated 10,000 Masons attended. A long, a long processional throughout the center city, the Grand Lodge officers led a traditional Masonic ritual using the plum, the level, and the square to symbolically try the granite cornerstone. Inside, a lead box containing Grand Lodge records and mementos. The cornerstone was lowered into the foundation in the northeast corner of the building along Juniper Street. The Grand Lodge officers consecrated the stone with corn, wine, and oil, praying for plenty, health, unity, peace, and prosperity. The ritual was interspersed with anthems and many speeches. The wood handle, marbled gavel that Grand Master Vox employed was the same one that Brother President and George Washington used 75 years earlier at the 1793 cornerstone laying ceremony of the United States Capitol building in Washington, D.C. Five and a half years later, over 13,000 Masons participated in the temple's lavish dedication festivities on September 26, 1873. The date also marked the 87th anniversary of the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania's independence from the Grand Lodge of England. Immaculately dressed in their black suits, white gloves, Masonic jewels, and special aprons for the occasion, the brethren paraded along with 30 brass bands. The pro processional began at 8.30 in the morning, and the last lodge marched through the building around 6 o'clock that evening. Local and national news media covered the parade, ceremonies, and banquet that filled the weekend with celebrations. The completed building was described as one beautiful symbol of the massive, unchangeable, uniform, consistent harmony and stability of the fraternity. In all, the fraternity spent more than $1.5 million for the temple and its site. The amount would be worth more than $39.8 million today. The largest expense was for the 15,700 granite blocks which composed the building, which cost just over half a million dollars. The Masonic Temple covers 37,500 square feet. <coughs> Approximately 12 million bricks were used in its construction. The North Tower rises to 147 feet and the South Tower to 232 feet. Prior to the construction of City Hall, the Masonic Temple was the tallest building in Pennsylvania and one of the tallest buildings in the world. Today it remains the 16th tallest building in Pennsylvania. The fraternity hoped that the temple may long stand as a monument to the strength, stability, prosperity, and energy of the craft in Pennsylvania and that enriched from time to time as opportunity and resources may allow with de decorative adornments and works of art. It may become more beautiful and attractive from year to year. Since its dedication, visitors were welcome to tour the Masonic Temple one day a week, provided the weather was clear, to protect the carpets. In the first two months, over 14,200 people visited. During 1875, an average of 450 visitors came each visiting day. In 1902, the building opened weekdays during nice weather. 
Since the early 19th century, Masons have created dramatic and romantic settings for their meetings to reinforce the timelessness they, describe, they ascribe to their ideals and rituals. The Masonic Temple's interior is a carefully designed fantasy of revival styles. Although the basic architectural styles of the rooms were substantially completed when new, they underwent extensive interior de decoration and elaborate painting between 1889 and 1908. This work was largely designed and executed by Brother George Herzl and his studio, Philadelphia's leading decorative painters at the time. When Egyptian Hall was first completed on January 12, 1889, approximately 12,000 people from the general public toured the room. Virtually all of this elaborate artwork and intricate adornment survives, as well as the building's electric, electric custom-made furniture. All of these ar architectural designs elements contributed to the Masonic Temple being designated a National Historic Landmark in 1985. Occupied continuously since its inception by the Grand Lodge and the Masonic Library and Museum of Pennsylvania. The Masonic Temple has benefited from constant, deliberate, and well-funded maintenance. Preservation professionals have expressed astonishment at the meticulous building records that have been kept, including the original architectural drawings. They provided a wealth of information for the architects preparing for the $8.1 million restoration project in 2008. Scaffolding wrapped the building for months while the exterior was cleaned, patched, and repointed. More recently, we have invested in an illumination project, joining our neighbors in highlighting the beauty of the city while increasing the safety of our streets at night. Much has changed in the 150 years since the Masonic Temple in Philadelphia first opened its doors. Yet this magnificent building remains a true testimony to the time-tested values of Freemasonry. Brotherly love, charity, and truth. The temple and the Masonic Library and Museum housed within it have served to inspire, educate, and entertain hundreds of thousands of students, artists, architects, historians, researchers, educators, and visitors from around the world. Thanks to generous supporters and our dedicated staff, we are able to continue to preserve, maintain, promote, and enlighten future generations through this majestic Masonic temple. So much more than a building, it remains a beacon for Freemasonry today, tomorrow, and always. Fill our grand design, see all our 
stars align. This is the moment, our final test. Destiny beckoned, we never reckon second best. We won't look down, we must not fall. This is the moment, the sweetest moment of them all. This is the moment, this is yours. This day or never, we sit forever with the gods. When we look back, we will recall. The Grand Lodge officers will assist me in rededicating this Masonic Temple of the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. Brother Grand Chaplain, offer the prayer. O eternal God, mighty in power and of majesty incomprehensible, whom the heaven of heavens could not contain, much less the walls of temples made with hands, mercifully look upon us, thy servants, now assembled in thy name and presence, and bless and prosper all our works begun, continued, and ended in thee. May all those who are lawfully appointed to rule in the Grand Lodge be under thy special guidance and protection, and faithfully fulfill and observe all their obligations to thee and to the Grand Lodge. Be pleased, O God, to vouchsafe that as we now pour the elements of consecration over this Masonic temple, they may be the harbingers of thy bounties to the brethren, and that we may all be blessed by thy goodness with the corn of nourishment. May the corn of plenty, resurrection, life, and beauty be showered upon the grand temple of the Grand Lodge, and may the labors of the craft refresh every giver of good and great gifts. In the name of the supreme and eternal God, the grand architect of heaven and earth, to whom be all honor and glory, I rededicate this Masonic temple to Freemasonry. With the wine of refreshment. May the wine of refreshment vouchsafe the health and safety of the craftsmen employed in preserving the Masonic Temple of the Grand Lodge. And may the Supreme Architect bless and prosper all their labors. In the name of the supreme and eternal God, the grand architect of heaven and earth, I rededicate this Masonic temple to virtue and science. And with the oil of joy.
May the oil of prosperity and happiness vouchsafe unity, peace, and prosperity to the people of Pennsylvania and to the nations of the earth. And may the supreme ruler of the world preserve and protect the fraternity of Freemasons and make the virtues of the craft a lesson to the world and the labors of the craftsmen easy and their burdens light. In the name of the supreme and eternal God, the grand architect of heaven and earth, to whom be all honor and glory, I rededicate this Masonic temple to universal benevolence. Grant, O Lord, that those who are now invested with the government of this grand lodge may be endued with wisdom to ins instruct the brethren in all their duties. May brotherly love, charity, and truth always prevail amongst the members of this Grand Lodge, and may these bonds of union continue to strengthen the lodges throughout the world. Bless all our brethren wherever dispersed, and grant speedy relief to all those who are oppressed or distressed. We affectionately commend to thee all the members of thy whole family. May they increase in their knowledge of thee and of their love for each other. Finally, may it please thee that finishing our work here below under thy protection, we may pass from this earthly abode to that heavenly temple above, in the city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Glory be to God on high. As it, As it was, was in the beginning, is it is now, and it shall, shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. So mote it be. To the glory of God and in the memory of Holy St. John, we rededicate this Masonic temple. May every brother revere his character and imitate his virtues. Glory be to God on high. As if it was in the beginning, is it now, and ever shall, shall be, world without end. Amen. So mote it be. Brother Grand Marshal, make the proclamation. Silence! 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 Brethren, take notice that Brother Jeffrey M. Wonderly, Right Worshipful Grand Master of the most ancient and honorable fraternity of free and accepted Masons in Pennsylvania and Masonic jurisdiction thereunto belonging, has this day, at this place, rededicated this Masonic temple. Brethren, take notice that Brother Jeffrey M. Wonderling, Right Worshipful Grand Master of the most ancient and honorable fraternity of free and accepted Masons in Pennsylvania and Masonic jurisdiction thereunto belonging, has this day, at this place, rededicated this Masonic temple. Brethren, take notice that Brother Jeffrey M. Wonderling, Right Worshipful Grand Master of the most ancient and honorable fraternity of free and accepted Masons in Pennsylvania and Masonic jurisdiction thereunto belonging, has this day, at this place, rededicated this Masonic temple. Wisdom, strength, fraternity. Brethren, ladies, and friends, by a show of hands, how many, how many uh, attendees here this afternoon have never been into this Masonic building or any Masonic building? So I'm going to talk, I'm, you know, I, I had an idea of what I was going to say today, and I went to Washington, D.C. two days ago, and I believe that we go nowhere by accident. So the last two days we spent um, going over the, the uh, we did a re-proclamation re of the Constitution, the Constitutions of the Freemasons, which was written sometime around 1723. So we were celebrating the 300th anniversary. And when you just take a look at those Constitutions, 
it soon becomes a, uh, pretty much, you could take it to the bank, that that document, who Brother Benjamin Franklin decided to print in 1724, and that document, which seemed to follow the settlers throughout this country as towns and cities were built, is a big reason why we live in the country we live today. He had the idea that good men, through their goodness, through their industry, through their strength, through their tolerance, could govern one another and treat each other fairly. So you fast forward eight years later, and we have the Provincial Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. Roughly 150 years after that, after the, the Constitutions, they dedicated this beautiful facility, which we are rededicating here today. So what's that all mean? It means that folks who, who knew the rules, who learned those constitutions, and learned how, how important they were through the formative years of this great country, not only here but around the world, that we could build a magnificent facility like this to continue to enlighten to educate and to enhance not only our members, but their families and society in general. I would encourage anybody to get a copy of Anderson's Constitutions of the Freemasons and just take a look. It's a very, very eye-opening exercise, and I'm sure you won't, you won't be disappointed. I'd like to thank the staff, not only here, but the ones that have gone before us, for the incredible job that they do in keeping this Masonic temple in the shape that, that, they, that they keep it in. To the uh, Library and Museum Board of Directors, who are always doing cap, uh, long range planning to make sure every, every inch of this remains as pristine as you see it here today, they deserve a lot of thanks. I'd like to thank our uh, our, uh, basically our wedding venue arm, one, who has, through the last six years, even with COVID, made this the number one wedding venue that is sought after in the city of Philadelphia. And I mentioned this at the quarterly communication. I think you know you've arrived when the Union League has a member <coughs> banquet here. That tells you that some, we're doing something right. So brethren, ladies, and friends, as long as we make our lodges, and most especially this grand building, a place where young men or any man can find their greatness, and a place where accomplished men can give something back, Freemasonry will always be here. And the idea of tolerance, brotherly love, charity, and truth is needed today. Thank you. I have, a, I have just a, a one or two other items here. Uh, first of all, I have a group here that I would like to take a minute. I'd like them to walk out behind the altar. They're called the Widow's Sons. They can walk right up behind the altar. They're going to put on their vests. Brother Ray Zeke or Zeke, raise your hand. So Brother Zeke is a, uh, is a chapter pre or the state president for this organization, and they have been working, working very, very hard, and all the donations and all the money they make go to support the Masonic Widows of Pennsylvania. Thank you very much, and uh, just a little plug, on August 5th, if you're not there, shame on you for, for, uh, for six weeks. Uh, we're having a... a, a uh, 
Grandmasters rally. Kickstands are up at about 10 a.m. at Syria Temple. Noon. At noon. Your, your feet aren't going to hit the ground for about two hours. We're going to ride through the tunnels and over the bridges with a police escort. And afterward, we're going to come back and we have four bands. The headliner is Molly Hatchet. So the hotel that we contract is already sold out. Two months out, so we'll, we'll Zeke, you'll find some hotel room somewhere, won't you? We have you? another hotel already set up. What's that? We have another hotel already set up. See, we got another hotel. You know, it's a, that's a good problem to have. So we're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, the Grand Master is going to ride. That's scary. Can I tell him? The, can I tell him the really scary news? In the front, brother. Uh, what's that? In the front, you're riding. I'm going to. Yeah, I'm going to ride in the front. Uh, Mrs. Haynes, would you please stand up? <laughs> Mrs. Haynes is going to ride with Zeke. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here, and thanks. All the money that we raised from this is going to go to support the Widows Fund. Thank you very much, and thanks for being here. You may be seated. While they're get, being seated, I just have one other quick announcement. Mr. and Mrs. <coughs> uh, Past Grand Master Ray Dietz and Mrs. Lynn Dietz, you're being called to the principal's office. I need to see you after the meeting. Other Grand Secretary, is there anything I missed? We have one more. Before he gets started, and before I forget, I want to give a big thank you, and may you, will you please recognize Brother Raymond Foose, Grand Lodge solo, soloist, and Brother Jeff, our Grand Lodge uh, organist. Thank you very much. <laughs> Brother Ray, I believe you're going to grace us with another solo.
So, so brethren, I, I want to leave you with one final thought, brethren and ladies. So we're talking about a long, long time ago. Three, nearly, well, it's 300 years since the Constitution, nearly 300 years for Pennsylvania Freemasonry. If you had a time traveler that could come here today, they wouldn't recognize electricity. They probably wouldn't recognize running water. They wouldn't recognize simple things we take for granted, asphalt, concrete, buildings like this. And while we have adapted and we need to continue to adapt our fraternity, if a time traveler walked into a Masonic Lodge and stayed for a meeting and the values we espouse, he would feel right at home. Thank you. Brother Grand Marshal. Hmm? Brother Grand Chaplain. Do a prayer. Brother Grand Chaplain. Give, give the prayer. <laughs> May the blessings of God Almighty, who made heaven and earth and all who dwell therein, be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. So mode be. Brother Grand Marshal, form the recessional. The brethren and guests will stand fast until the Grand Lodge party has retired. Grand Parsifal. Grand Stewart. Grand Deacons. Grand Chaplains. Age to the Grand Master. District Deputy Grandmasters. District Deputy Grandmasters. 